Can we put our hands together right now and welcome each other to church? Isn't that awesome? Wow, so awesome. So awesome. Well, listen, we're going to dive right in. And we've been in a series called Restored. As I was praying last year, at the end of the year, asking God, God, what is the work? What are you going to do in the new year? And I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Restored. And he took me to a passage of scripture, and I want to read that scripture with you today. And can we do this in every location? Those joining us online, would you do it with us as well? Can we stand and honor the reading of God's word? I'm just going to take a moment to honor his word. And I want you to read this. Canyon Country, come on, you read it loud. Georgia, read it loud. Kentucky, read it loud. Joel chapter 2, verse 25, and here's what it says. Read it with me. You ready? So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. God said this, listen, there was this infestation of locusts that just destroyed and ravaged the crop. But here's what happened. God said, I'm going to bring a blessing and I'm going to give you back the years that the locusts have stolen. I believe 2024, you're going to see some relationships restored. You're going to see some financial dreams restored. You're going to see some new things. Amen? Come on, how many say amen to that? So can we do this? Let's take a moment and let's pray. All of our locations. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would send your anointing, that you would speak through me. Lord, but I pray also that you would prepare our hearts to hear and receive. God, I thank you that you have a message of restoration. So speak, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. It's interesting because when you read the book of Joel, what you need to understand is a few things, and that is that the book of Joel is a prophetic book, meaning that it has a parallel message. One of the messages that it has is for the people that lived in Israel at that time. And what it says in the beginning is, hey, there's been this massive infestation of locusts that have destroyed the crops several years in a row. And so you need to tell what happened to your children because God says this. He said, this is a warning to the Israelites. It's a warning. I warned you when you came into the land back way back hundreds of years earlier, you can read it in the book of Deuteronomy, that if you stray from me, if you worship other gods, if you don't give yourself wholeheartedly to me and you you begin to turn from me, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send locusts, and they're going to devour the crops. And he says, this is just a warning that even more could happen. Worse could take place. So he's saying, I'm warning you. How many here have ever had someone give you a warning? Right? God is warning them. But it's not just for the Israelites in that day. This is a prophetic book of what is going to happen in the future. Because it references a thing called the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is basically referencing how God is going to be involved in the end time. He's going to intervene in humanity. He's going to bring this all to a close. One day we're going to all go to heaven. Satan's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. He's going to judge the unrighteous. And so, in fact, if you're interested, next weekend we're going to talk about that theme, the end time, the day of the Lord. We're going to, if you've heard of things like the tribulation, if you've heard of things like um, the mark of the beast, if you've heard of things like the millennium, we're going to talk about those things because Joel says that unless my people repent, there's going to be some, some challenges coming. But if they will repent and they'll turn to me, he said, I'm going to restore. Now, we can't stop God's timetable. But what we can do is we can receive his restoration because we respond to his promise. How many want to respond to his promise? Amen. So last weekend we learned we need to repent. And so we had a a weekend and we've been in 21 days of prayer and fasting and repentance. So today what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about how the God said he's going to restore in, in 2024. Several years ago, my family uh, decided to redo the kitchen. The kitchen was not, you know, stuff in there wasn't working. A burner on the oven wasn't working. A, a drawer didn't pull out right. And things just weren't. So we're like, you know, we need to upgrade, make it look nicer, and we need to get everything working right. And so we put in the money and had a contractor come in and they started doing it. How many know when you start a con, you know, construction project, it's chaos, right? And so it was the kitchen. 
So it was chaotic, right? And we were stressed out all the time because, I mean, for a while, we didn't have an oven. We didn't have a refrigerator. We didn't have anything. It's like, do we use a hot plate? Do we go out to dinner? You know, what do we do? And so it was chaotic. And man, I got to tell you, it was so awesome. When it was done, it looked beautiful, but the burners worked, the microwave worked, the oven worked, everything worked. In fact, it was better than it was before. That's what the word restored means in the scripture. I want to read it to you because it's a Hebrew word and it's the word shalom, which comes from the word shalom. And we'll talk about shalom in a minute, which is the, the, the word that you know, Israelis use. And we, we know in Hebrew, shalom, which means peace, which means blessing, which means prosperity, which means wholeness. The word shalom is similar and it's, it means this. It means to give back, make complete, make whole, make at peace, make you happy, make you well. Come on, how many want God in 2024 to make you complete, give back, make you complete, make you whole, give you peace, make you happy, and make you well? That's what God wants to do in 2024. So Canyon Country, Georgia, Minnesota, we're going to learn how does God restore? How does he do that? And I'm going to give you, as we go through the book of Joel, it gives us some insights because when we think of restored, we might think of things like, okay, maybe I had a marriage that was falling apart, but God, in 2024, you're going to put it back together and heal our marriage. Maybe that's the restoration God has for you in 2024. But you know what? God doesn't just do that. He does so much more. That's why the Bible says he can do exceedingly abundantly about you can have an ass, dream, or imagine according to his power working within you. So when you read Joel, we're going to see it. So here's how God is going to bring restoration, I believe, for those that believe and call out to him. You ready? Here's the first thing. If taking notes, write this down. Number one, he's going to remove the enemy. Come on, somebody say remove the enemy. Now, we're going to go into that. And let me just say, it seems like we've got someone with us that is struggling a little bit. And that's okay. Right now, we're going to make room and space for everybody to hear the word. So don't let it distract you. It's okay. All right? So we're going to be, we're going to be good. How many can hear the word still today? All right? And if, if it gets real difficult, then they'll make the adjustment. But hang in there with me. We want everyone to hear the word. Remove the enemy. Here's what it says in Joel chapter 2. It says, The Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and, stay and, and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far away from you the northern army and will drive away into a barren and desolate land. His stench, the enemy, will, be, will come up and his foul order will rise. In other words, I'm going to re remove the enemy and I'm going to destroy the enemy. And because he's destroyed, there's going to be the odor of his defeat, of his demise. When something dies, how many know it smells? And then it says this, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Here's the message. When God begins to restore, one of the first things he does is he comes in and he removes the threat of the enemy. Let me explain it this way. I'll, I'll unpackage this. So when we first moved into this area, we moved into the Castaic um, area, and we lived up on top of Hillcrest right next to this hill, and the hill was so big that you couldn't get a cell signal. And this was back before you could do Wi-Fi calling and they had little, those little mini cell towers you put in your house. So we literally had no cell coverage at our home. No matter what we did, every provider, nobody could give it to us. So all we had was that home line. Anybody still have a home line? Wave at me if you still have a home line. We have a few people. All right. How many of you gave up on a home line years ago? All right. Okay. So we were home and, and had the home line. And I left that morning to go into LA to do something for the church. And I was gone. And suddenly... I see the home line ring on my phone. I pick it up because I have cell coverage. Now I'm out and about. And it's Devette, my wife. And she's like, Jared, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, settle down. It's okay. What's going on? She's like, the kids were outside and they were by the, by the basketball hoop. And while they're out there, they heard a sound. And I'm like, well, what was the sound? They said it sounded like rattling. And I'm like, oh my goodness. She goes, yeah, I think, oh my goodness. I think it's a snake. I think a rattlesnake's out there. I'm like, well, did you bring him in? She's like, yeah, they came in. I brought him in. I'm like, well, you need to find out. So I'm far away. I can't get to you. I'm, I'm a few hours before I'm going to get home. But at least go out from a distance and see if you can see if there's, you know, something there that could be harmful, if it's a snake. 
So she goes out and puts the phone down. It's silent for a minute. She comes back. She goes, it's a snake. There's a snake out there. I mean, here's the thing. My wife hates snakes. She hates snakes. And she goes, it's, a, it's got a rattle on it. I go, how big is it? And she says, it's not very big. It's pretty small. I'm like, oh, it's a baby rattler. Now, if you don't know this, baby rattlers are more dangerous than adult rattlers. And here's why. Because they don't know how to control their venom. So when they bite you, they'll release all the venom versus a, a, an adult snake would just give you a little bit. So it's even more dangerous. She's like, it's a, it's a snake. And I'm like, well, that's a baby snake. That's even more, a baby rattler. She's like, oh no, what are we gonna do? I mean, she starts freaking out. And I'm like, settle down, settle down, focus, focus. Come on, anybody ever been in this? I'm like, focus. She's like, what are we gonna do? I'm like, well, lock the doors, bring the children in. I mean, wait a minute. Bring the children in, lock the doors. Some of you do that in the summer. You're like, go out and play, lock the doors. Not really, not really. Bring the kids in and just close the doors so the snake can't get in. She's like, okay, okay, I'm going to do that. And I'm like, so she does. And I'm like, okay, now I'll be home. Just don't worry about it. I'll be home. You know, when I get back from this thing, it'll be a few hours. I'll be home and I'll take care of it. So I think everything's good. 30 minutes later, the phone rings again. I'm like, hello. She's like, what are we going to do? What if it gets into the house? If it gets in the house, what are we going to do? And she's like going through, well, what if it sneaks through somehow? And then we're in the house and the snake's in the house. Then do we go outside and lock it in? I mean, she's just like freaking out. She's stressed out because she hates snakes. Long story short is for those two hours, I had no peace. I had no shalom because she was stressed out because of the threat of the enemy. But here's the good news. A few hours later, I come rolling in. I got out of the car. I went into the, the garage. And maybe you're someone who loves animals and you know, supports PETA and all these things. Good for you. But you're probably not going to like me. I went into the garage. <laughs> and I got a shovel. And I didn't take it and put it back in the wild. I took care of the enemy. I'm just going to say that right now. I severed the head, I put the head and the body in the, in the trash can, and I walked into the house and I said, I have taken care of the threat. <laughs> and Yvette, she's like, are you sure? Did you, what, did you see it? Did it go into the woods? What, did you scare it away? And I'm like, no, I killed it. It's, it's dead. She's like, well, what if there are more? What if there are more out there? What if the mom and dad are there? And I'm like, babe, I've checked. There's no snakes. I have killed the snake. The threat is gone. She's like... And finally, I'm like, come with me. So I grab her and we walk outside and I take her to the trash can. And I open the trash can and she looks inside and she smells. She's like, oh, that's disgusting. Because how many know when something dies, it begins to decay and it starts to smell? See, once she smelled the stench, she knew that the threat was dead. Her whole countenance changed. She was like, oh. It was a different home. And that is the message of what God does when he begins the restoration in your life. He said, I am going to take care of the threat. I'm going to, these locusts, I'm going to drive them out. They're going to die. But one day when the enemy comes, if you repent and turn to me, they're not going to take you captive. I'm going to take them out and I'm going to take care of the threat. And here's the good news. The good news is simply this, is God, when he brings restoration, he removes the threat of the enemy so that you can get your shalom, your peace back. There's a lot of people that are living in fear, living frustrated. Can I tell you, listen, we, we do have an enemy. In this world, we have an enemy. His name is Satan. The devil, he's real. The biggest lie of the enemy is to get you to believe that he doesn't exist. Jesus said there's an enemy. In John chapter 10, listen to what he says. He says, the enemy or the thief, speaking of Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly or have it to the full. He says there's an enemy that wants to devour your dreams. He wants to devour your healthy relationships. He wants to devour your financial health. But I've come to give you life. What's interesting, and most people don't know, is this verse is in the midst of a context where he's talking about this idea of the shepherd and the sheep. And here's what he says. He says, you know what? When there are sheep, there's a shepherd, and the shepherd takes care of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. He said, now there are shepherds who are hired shepherds that aren't like the good shepherd. They're, they're just paid, right, by, by the people to take care of the sheep. And he says, a wolf will come. And when the wolf comes, they're like, 
A paycheck or death? I'm out of here. I want to keep my life. So they'll run and leave the sheep to be taken by the wolf. But he said, I'm not like that. I'm the good shepherd. I'm willing to lay down my life for the sheep. I'm going to protect the sheep. You see, when Jesus came into this world and he died on a cross, what was he doing? The Bible says that when he died on the cross, he went into the bowels of hell. He took away the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He defanged the wolf. He took away the authority of Satan. And now you and me, when he rose from the grave, now you and me can have eternal life. And all the enemy can do is prowl around like a lion or a wolf. And he can roar. And he can bark. And he can intimidate. But his fangs are gone. His power is gone. The threat is gone. You and I can have eternal life because of Jesus. Come on. That's why the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me by by still waters. With his rod and his staff, they comfort me. And even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid because you are with me. Look what he says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of all the wolves and all my enemies. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What is that, that whole verse saying, that whole, that whole chapter? Here's what it's saying, is that I'm going to remove the power and the threat of the enemy, and because of it, you're going to get to lie down, you're going to get to be in comfort, you're going to eat in peace because I'm giving you your shalom back. Amen. So I, I speak, I prophetically speak over you today. Maybe you've been waiting for the other shoe to drop. Maybe you've been waiting for your company to go out of business. Maybe you've been waiting for your marriage to finally be done and get those, those papers for divorce. Maybe you've been afraid of what's going to happen with the election. Maybe you've been afraid of what's going to happen with my kids. I want to tell you something. 2024, God is saying, you're going to get your peace back again. Amen. I'm restoring the threat of the enemy. He's been defamed. And by the way, one day... He's going to be like that snake. He's going into the pit of hell. God's going to throw him there. And you and I will have eternity without the threat forever. Come on, amen. Come on, Canyon Country. Somebody shout amen. So number one, he's going to remove the threat of the enemy. That's part of his restoration process. You're not going to live afraid anymore. You're going to be like the story of my wife. Peace. Number two, restoration means... He's going to cause things to grow again. Let's keep reading in in, uh, Joel chapter 2. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain... And the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine. Here's what's interesting. He says, in this restoration process, here's what I really believe God's saying. In 2024, look at me. This is important. Can you country look at me? Your efforts are going to be fruitful in the new year. Think about it. The children of Israel had worked so hard on their harvest. They found the land. They cleared the land. They, they prepared the land so that it could be, they could sow seed. They sowed the seed. They watered it. They fertilized it. Along came the, you know, the rain, and, and it began to grow, and, and they were getting ready for the harvest. And then what happens? The devouring locusts came in and robbed everything. Imagine the disappointment, the devastation to know all of that work was wasted. And I want to tell you, there's a lot of people right now, I believe, especially since COVID, and it may have to do with relationships, it may have to do with even your spiritual journey, it may have to do with uh, something involving business, and you just feel like you've worked so hard and you've done so much, and then literally it was all devoured, and and literally it's like it was all just a big waste of time. I'll I'll give you an an example, because that's what happened to Israel. The locust had stolen. I was... I was in college years ago, and I'll never forget one semester, I had a paper that was due, and so I was preparing to write that paper, and when I, when I, I did, by the way, I had to do what a lot of times um, people today don't understand, I had to go to the library. <laughs> there was no such thing as Google, 
And so what happened is, is, is I went to the library, I researched all the books that I needed to get, and I checked out the books, and I came, brought them back to my room and did what you did. You found the stuff, and you copied it, and you wrote it down, and you're, you're building your paper. And I spent, it took me about eight hours. And, and the, due, the paper was due the next day. I don't know why I waited so late, but I did. And, and so I was, I was gonna, gonna turn the paper in the next morning, and I, I remember after about eight hours of working so hard, I worked hard, and I, I was about to finish. And so it was done. In fact, when I, I wrote the last word, it was like, I literally, I think I went like this. Anybody ever had one of those ones? Like, oh, praise God. And then I went like this to, to hit the print button because I was using something that many of you younger generation don't know of. It's called a word processor. <laughs> and let me give you a little history here. So before the word processor was the typewriter. How many remember the typewriter? Okay, then they came up with a thing that wasn't quite a computer, but it wasn't quite a typewriter. It was called the word processor. And so you could like type in there whatever you needed to type, and then it would print it off. But this was before we had hard drives and before we had iClouds and before we could back things up on Dropbox. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? And so I went to hit the button to print and the thing froze. And I was like, whoa, what am I going to do? And so I'm like, oh no, oh no, okay, I'll, wait. I'll just wait a couple seconds, maybe it'll work itself out, and I wait a couple seconds, it's still frozen, it's still frozen, so then I have to do what the only thing you could do in those days, and that's turn it off and start it back up, and when I did, it was gone, and I was devastated, because I'm like, I've wasted all that time. It's like, I'm quitting school. I just feel like there's a lot of people that are looking at the new year and you feel like, I don't even want to try to have my marriage be better this year. I don't even want to try to, to get that company going again. I'm just going to go work for a, a corporation. I don't want to even try to, to see things turn around. I, I don't want to give it an effort. I, I'm done. I don't, got any more, I don't have any more left in me. What I love the message of this is that God says, no, no, no. Here's really what the message is. What you couldn't do with your own efforts, God is going to cause you to do in half the time. Amen. In other words, you're going to start to grow again. What did it say? It said the vats would fill up with wine and oil. The, 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 the trees will suddenly start to blossom. Things are going to begin to grow. You're going to begin to be fruitful, and it's going to be effective. You're going to start, because there are people here in the past, you've worked really hard to put this deal together, and then at the last second, the funding fell through. Or maybe you worked really hard to, to, to land that client, and you met with them over and over again, and, and what happened? At the last second, they went with another company. Or you said, you know what? COVID messed up our family, but I'm going to do an effort to try to bring the family together again. And now, after working so hard, everybody's mad at each other again. And you're like, it's just a waste of time, but I'm here to tell you the good news is God says, I can take what you were doing, and and now I can make it effective and I can make it efficient and I can make it fruitful again. You know what's crazy about the story? Is um, I called my mom and I was like, Mom, I'm quitting school. <laughs> Somebody like, so, so drama, Pastor Jerry. You're so drama. That's why I felt. And she said, no, you're not. You're going to finish that paper before tomorrow. But you know what's crazy? Is after I kind of gained my composure... I rewrote it in 30 minutes. Why? Because everything had already been done. I'd already done it once. God redeemed the time. And what took you 10 years might take you one year. What took you five months might take you five days. Because God is able to. What does the Bible say in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For whoever sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit re reap everlasting life. And then it says this, and let us not grow weary while we're doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. Here's the point. You can't sow, I mean, you can't reap if you don't sow. So what the devil does is he threatens you and he tries to discourage you and stop you from going back in up into the harvest field. 
and he makes you think that things are never going to change. But the Bible says, keep on praying, keep on fasting, keep on tithing, keep on serving, keep on working that company, keep on doing the things you're doing. And here's what God says in the new season, I'm going to make you effective. I'm going to make you efficient. I'm going to make you fruitful. And there is going to be a due season and you're going to get a harvest because I'm a God who restores. Come on, Canaan country, shout amen. So God will make you fruitful. Here's the other thing is, is that God will give you the fuel to get back into the field. Because that's what we say. We're like, I just don't think I have it in me. I don't think I have it in me to try to have a child. We've been disappointed too many times. I don't think I have it in me to find a godly spouse. I'm just going to be single or I'm going to settle. I don't think I have it in me. And how many times does the enemy come and he gets us discouraged? But I love what it says. It says, I'm going to make you fruitful because things are going to begin to blossom. And then he says this, and he will cause the rain to come down on you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. You see, what he's talking about is the rains that watered the crops. And there was what was called the former rain, which took place in the fall of the year. And then there was the latter rain, which took place in the spring of the next year. And what God literally says is he says, listen, I'm going to combine them. I'm going to give you a double portion. So you're not just going to get one set of rain. You're going to get two sets of rain at the same time. I'm going to double your portion. Here's what's interesting. When the rain comes, things grow. Remember last year and a half ago when we were in drought, everything was dead. Everything was brown. We hadn't had rain forever. And what happens? Suddenly we had an amazing year. In fact, it started raining like crazy. How many of you felt like Noah was about to show up? (laughs) I mean, it was crazy, right? And one weekend, we got seven or eight inches of rain. Did you know that normally in Southern California, we get 10 to 12 inches? We almost got a whole year's rain in one weekend. And it kept coming. We ended up last year getting something like 24 inches, more than double the amount of rain. But here's kind of the interesting thing. Once the rain, the fuel came, everything turned green. The reservoirs filled back up. You see, the rain is the fuel for growth. And the reason I point that out is because in the Bible, when we see rain or water, often it's symbolic of the spirit of God. And what God is saying is, I'm going to send you a double portion of my spirit so that you have the fuel to get back out into the field. You'll have the fuel to go out there and try again. You have the fuel to continue to be faithful in doing good. You'll have the fuel to step out of where you are and dare to believe for my promises. I'll end this point with this thought. There's the story of the bamboo tree. If you've never heard it, let me tell you. If you wanted to grow a bamboo tree, the way it works is you go and you prepare the soil, you plant it, and you water, and you wait. And you might go, okay, this year I'm going to have that bamboo tree. It's going to look so good. You'll wait all year long and nothing will happen. Year two will come, and you'll start watering, and nothing will happen. Year three will come. You'll keep watering and nothing will happen. Year four will come and you'll want to give up, but you keep on watering and nothing will happen. But then comes year five. And in year five, here's what happens. Within six weeks, it'll grow 90 feet tall. All of that time, nothing's going on. And in six weeks, it goes up 90 feet in the air. And you might say, that's kind of crazy, but here's what's interesting. The whole time that you thought nothing was happening, things were happening, because under the surface was the root system. And in order to grow up, it had to grow down. So for five years, it was growing deep and deeper and deeper and deeper. You know what kind of makes me think of? It makes me think of that song we sang today. Um, that we say, even though I don't see that you're working, even when I can't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You, never, you see, why you think nothing's going on, what God is saying in the book of Joel is, I'm already working on your comeback. I'm already working on your restoration. I'm already working on your promise. I'm already working. Things are going deep. So hang in there and get back in the field. Keep on being faithful because I'm here to tell you that I will make you fruitful again. Come on, somebody shout amen. Amen. And there's a song that I, I don't know if I have time to play, but I wanted to play a a little song about the reign of God's presence. Because we, how many give me two extra minutes to preach? Okay, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, eight. Okay. (laughs) 
an old song that goes like this. Let the rain of your presence fall on me every day that I live. With every breath I breathe, let the rain of your presence fall on me. Everywhere that I go, Lord, let your presence flow, rain on me. Love divine, joy unspeakable, overflowing in my soul. This heart of mine is refreshed and at rest in your presence, in your presence, rain on me. I feel the Holy Spirit here right now. Could you just close your eyes for a second? The Holy Spirit comes, and he's the one that strengthens us. He's the one that refreshes us. He's the one that fills us with the power, the fuel to fulfill our purpose. So can you do something right now? I just want to invite you to do something. I want you to do it over in Canyon Country right now. Will you just lift your hand? Just lift a hand towards heaven. Holy Spirit, I pray. Like when we put that, that nozzle into the car and we flip the switch and suddenly the fuel begins to come right now we're lifting our hands as a connection with the holy spirit with your presence and we pray right now for those that have said i'm done i don't got any more in me i'm at the end of my rope i pray right now released by the spirit of god a fresh touch of your spirit let the rain of your spirit pour out right now in every heart in every man in every woman in every dad in every mom, in every child. Lord, we receive your rain. Let it come. Send the rain. Fill us with your power. We'll be fruitful again. Thank you that strength comes through the power of your presence. Receive it now. Right now, receive it in Canyon Country. Receive it in Pennsylvania. Receive it in Kentucky right now. You're getting stronger in Jesus' name. If you receive that, somebody say amen. <laughs> Restoration. He removes the threat of the enemy. He makes things grow again. And here's the last thing. He removes the shame. He removes the shame. I'm going to read to you what the scripture says. It says in Joel chapter 2, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts. Let me pause right there. When I read this, I wanted to take time to preach on this, but I don't know if I'm going to get into it and have time in the series. But when you see this devouring, it's a process. The devastation of sin and the devastation of the enemy doesn't happen overnight. Starts with the chewing locust, the swarming locust, the, and, and you you let the you let the enemy just a little bit in, and you start compromising just a little bit, and then it gets a little bit more, and the next thing you know, the enemy has come and he's devastated our lives. But I love that God can take the years. He says, "I'll restore to you the years that these locusts have have stolen." Verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. First of all, what I love is he says in here is he says this. He says, I'm not just going to give you back the harvest that you lost. I'm going to give you back the years that you lost from losing the harvest. And I want to say there are people here right now, there are people in Canyon Country right now, in Arizona right now, that you have lost years of your life. Maybe because of a health issue. You thought you were going to go to the pros and you had the gifting to do it, but you had an injury. And years of your life you lost, of the dream. 
Maybe you're here and, and you, you, you had a vision financially to be at a certain place and then the economy messed everything up and you lost stuff and now you're way behind. You lost years financially. The devastation has cost you. How many, here's the question, what has the years robbed you of? Some people here today that are joining us in, in Canyon Country or in Minnesota or right here in Valencia, maybe for you, you've lost um, years of, of, of peace. Maybe you have years, of love, you've, you've had years that have been loveless years. Maybe you have years that have been rebellious years. I can't tell you how many, can I tell you something I've never heard? I've never heard someone say, you know, I wish I would have got saved later in life. <laughs> never heard it. You know, I've heard those, I've heard people say, I wish I'd have got saved sooner. My life would have been so much different. We lose the years, and I love that he's promised the years. I'm going to restore the years. The other thing he's telling them is this. He says, I'm going to restore your reputation and remove the shame. You see, Israel was known to be the people of God. We would not have the Bible if God hadn't chosen the nation of Israel. And it's, it's so interesting to see as we talk about the end time. I'm just going to go off, 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 off my notes here for a minute. As we look at the end time, Israel is a strategic part of God's plan for the end time. He's made a covenant with them. And you and I should know about that. We should pray for Israel. We should pray for the peace of Israel. Yes, we want war to stop all over the world. And yes, we don't want there to be innocent casualties that happen and all of that. But we need to be praying for Israel. We need to be praying for peace for Israel. We need to be praying for blessing in Jerusalem. Do you know the Bible said if you pray for blessing in Jerusalem, God will bless you. The Bible is filled. We, we, we are part of Israel because we've been grafted into the vine because of Jesus. And so the Bible says that they were known as the people of God. But you know what's interesting? They had lost their reputation. Here's what people were saying. God has left them. God has left them. They lost their reputation. It was a place of shame. And I want to tell you, there's some people here today that you feel like God has left you. Maybe some things have happened. Maybe some mistakes have been made. Maybe not even by you. Maybe by someone in your family or someone in your company. And you feel like now you've been stained by the shame of your past. And what I love about this book is that God not only wants to restore what was taken, he wants to restore your name. Amen. It's interesting, there's a story in the Bible, and I'll quickly go there, about a man by the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan. Who was Jonathan? He was David's close covenant friend. King David was going to be the, the new king, right, of, of the nation of Israel, Saul was the king who happened to be Jonathan's father, and Saul had become evil. He had turned on God. He was trying to kill God's anointed. And what happens is that because he's turned evil, Jonathan says to David, listen, we're friends, and I'm going to do everything I can to help you, but if we make this covenant, would you remember my family and always take care of my family, even if I die? David said, I'll always take care of your family when I become king. And we know the story. If you've read it, eventually Saul dies. And Jonathan dies. And normally when a king died, the new king who came into power, if he wasn't a part of that same you know, lineage, um, DNA and so on, they would kill all of the, the people that were descendants of the king so that no one would have the ability to claim the throne. So when the king died, what did they do? They grabbed Mephibosheth because he was you know, a grandson of the king, and they ran with him to hide him, which is what normally would happen. They would try to hide those that were a part of the, the king's, you know, line so that they could eventually become king again. And when they did, they stumbled, they fell. Mephibosheth has an accident. It, it basically uh, wrecks his leg, and he becomes a cripple. Jonathan's brother becomes king in Israel for a short time. His name is Ishbosheth. But after a short time, Ishbosheth dies. He's killed. And then they bring David and make him king. So we say, where are you going with this story? What does this have to do about restoration and about shame? Well, here's what you got to understand. As you see, David, after he became king, here's what he said. He said, you know what? I made a covenant. 
And that covenant was that I was going to take care of my friend Jonathan's family. Is there anybody left in Saul's line? Is there anybody left in Jonathan's family? And they find a man by the name of Ziba, which, by the way, all of the properties, all of the money, all of the herds, all of the fame of the, of the kingdom of Saul, the king of Saul was given away to someone else. And this servant says, I know there's a son of Jonathan. He's, a, he's crippled. He lives in Lodabar. David said, bring him in. So imagine being Mephibosheth when that phone rings, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> and he's thinking, what? The king wants to see me? Oh, no, he's going to chop my head off. He's going to get rid of the last line of Saul. And so he comes before the king, and he bows down, and he says, who am I that you would see a dead dog like me? He was acknowledging that I'm worth nothing. I'm, I, my life is shame. Somebody said, why was his life shame? Well, let me give you some reasons why he had a stain of shame on his life. Here's why he had the stain of shame on his life. Number one, because... He was the grandson of King Saul who was evil and had turned away from God, rebelled from God. Not only that, he had shame on his life because his uncle who became king, Ishbosheth, guess what Ishbosheth's name means in the Hebrew? Man of shame. Not only that, he was crippled. And in those days, if you had a disability like that, it wasn't just that you had a physical ailment or a mental ailment. It's that you were cursed of God. So he was seen as someone cursed of God. Shame. And then where did he live? Out in the middle of nowhere in a place called Lodabar, which means the land of no pastures. And this man who has nothing, who's poor, who's crippled, who has no reputation comes before the king and the king looks at him and says, are you truly the son of Jonathan? He says, yes, I am. He said, then today things are going to change because from now on, you're not going to live poor in the middle of nowhere with no pastures. You're going to eat from the table of the king. And he says, and as of today, I am going to make sure that every single thing that belonged to your family is restored to you. You now have all the property. You have all now the savings. You have all of the herds. You have all of the wealth of King Saul. I am now here by declaring that it all is yours. In one word, in one moment, God completely restored his place of shame into a place of fame. He became one of the wealthiest men in all of Israel. Everything changed from just one word from the king. Can I give you some good news? We don't serve a king. We serve the king of all kings. And we serve the Lord of all lords. And he's the kind of God that can in one word, in one moment, he can restore everything that the enemy, the years that the enemy, the shame from your past. What does the Bible say in Christ? We are a new creation. All things are passed away and all things have been made new. Listen, God can restore everything with one word. You don't have to live with the mark of that past. You don't have to live with the mark of that failure God has given you a new name. It's called the son and the daughter of God.